sorry for the inordinate delay in getting things fixed there, but beyond uh, control. Right, so we got started with the rudiments of geometrical optics in the last class. We looked at some fundamentals of reflection and refraction on plane and curved surfaces. Recall, uh, we derived the basic equation for reflection on a curved surface and refraction on the curved surface towards the end of our uh, last class. And for a curved spherical surface, we arrived at a relationship 1 by v plus 1 by u equal to 2 by r. u, v and r were referred to as the algebraic object distance, image distance and radius of curvature. All of you were pretty comfortable with the sign convention, I presume. And I told you unequivocally that the distances were measured from the pole of the mirror, measured in the same direction as incident ray. Those distances were deemed negative, opposite to the direction of the incident ray, positive, right? Now, if there is a ray of light which is coming from a very large distance, coming from a very large, there is a beam incident on the mirror, again, paraxial, very large distance, then u tends to infinity. Optic distance is then infinity. The all these beams, all these rays converge at a certain point on the principal axis, and that point is referred to as the principal focus. That point is referred to as the principal focus of the mirror. So if when u is infinity, v is said to be the focal length f of the mirror. V then is said to be the focal length f of the mirror. Right? So if you put u is infinity, then v becomes the focal length and we then get, if you put u equal to infinity, we get v equal to or rather f equal to r by 2 when u is infinity. When u is infinity, the image distance becomes equal to the focal length and which is half the radius of curvature of the mirror, half the radius of curvature of the mirror. Now, what this off? Right? So, 2 by r could be written then as 1 by f. So, 1 by v plus 1 by u equal to 1 by f. That's the conventional form of the mirror equation. 1 by v plus 1 by u equal to reciprocal of the focal length, the conventional form of the equation of a mirror. Now, What I took up after this was refraction on a curved surface and we derived like the image space refractive index by image distance minus object space refractive index by object distance is difference in the refractive indices divided by the radius of curvature, right? That's for a single curved spherical surface. Now when we have two spherical curved surfaces coming in communion with each other and bounding a transparent medium, for example, let's say these are two curved surfaces, one with algebraic radius of curvature R1 and this one with algebraic radius of curvature R2. And they bound within their precincts a transparent medium and they bound within their precincts a transparent medium. Then this arrangement, this arrangement is referred to as a lens. This arrangement is referred to as a lens. Two bounded curved surfaces bounding a transparent medium is a lens. Within the purview of the plus two syllabus, what we have essentially is thin lenses, thin lenses. We look at the equations and geometry that is related to thin lenses. That means the maximum thickness is really, really very small, is really very small. Now, these two bounding surfaces, these two bounding spherical surfaces have a common principal axis, have a common principal axis. The center of this and the center of this lie along a common line, which is the principal axis of the lens, which is the principal axis of the lens. Inside the lens, inside the lens, 
on the principal axis of the lens, inside the lens, on the principal axis of a lens, there is a point commonly referred to as O. A point commonly referred to as O, the optical center of the lens, which is the optical center of the lens. Inside the lens, inside the lens, on the principal axis, there is a point which is the optical center of the lens. The optical center has a certain property. The optical center has a certain property. The property is that if there is a ray of light which is incident on the lens, if there is a ray of light which is incident on the lens and it gets refracted through the lens and makes its passage through O and makes its passage through O, then the emergent ray the emergent ray would be parallel to the incident ray. This is the incident ray, this is the refracted ray and this ray is said to be the emergent ray. The emergent ray is parallel to the incident ray. Such is the character of this point O, oh, the optical center of the lens. Any ray of light when it makes its passage through O within the lens will have its incident ray and emergent ray parallel to each other, parallel to each other. Like in mirrors, the distances were measured with respect to the pole of the mirror. In lenses, all distances are measured with respect to the optical center O of the lens. Optical center O of the lens. Now, let's arrive at a, the basic mathematics of a thin lens. Basic mathematics of a thin lens. Again, needless to say, if the lens is thin, whether I measure distances from this point or I measure distances from this point or I measure distances from O, they would be regarded the same for all practical cal calculations. All right. Now, say a transparent medium bounded by two curved spherical surfaces. This has the principal axis, this has the principal axis. This is algebraic radius R1, this is algebraic radius R2. Same convention, if there is a reference incident ray, then distances measured in the same direction as the incident ray from the optical center would be regarded negative, else positive, right? Now, let's say there is an object A. There is an object A and the algebraic object distance that you associate with this is U. The algebraic object distance that you associate with this is U. And we propose, we propose constructing the, looking at the image of A, subsequent to two refractions. Refraction on this surface, the first curved surface, then passage through the lens and then refraction on the second surface giving us the final image, giving us the final image. Let's refer to the refractive index of the material of the lens, the transparent medium as mu. And on two sides of the lens, in general, let's assume two different optical media, mu1 and mu2. Mu1 and mu2 are two different optical media on the two sides of the lens. Now, suppose there is a ray of light which is incident like this on the first refracting surface, on the first refracting surface. This ray of light in the absence of in the absence of the lens, in the absence of mu, with just this around, would have liked to converge, let's say, to after refraction from the first surface, would have liked to converge to a point, let's say, A prime, would have liked to converge to a certain point, A prime, you know. It travels like this, it travels like this, and 
it would have wanted to converge to a prime if the second surface was not there. If the second surface was not there, it would have liked. And if this was not mu, that means this entire thing was mu too. It would have suffered just one refraction and it would have wanted to converge to a prime after the first refraction. That means if there was just mu1 and mu2 separated by a curved surface here, then a prime would have turned out to be the image of a, a prime would have turned out to be the image of a, right? But never happened that way. Rays of light never could reach the point a prime because well before they could reach a prime, they got prematurely refracted on this surface and eventually instead of converging at a, they went on to converge at some point i. They went on to converge at some point i. I then turned out to be the final image after having suffered two successive refractions on the two bounding faces, on the two bounding surfaces. Right? A i then turns out to be the final image. Yes or no? But now, ask the second surface. Second surface converges the ray of light to a point i. And you ask the second surface, hey, that's the image. But what do you think is the object? The second surface will tell you, well, the object is a prime. The object is a prime. In fact, for the figure that I have drawn, the second, for the second surface, this will be like a virtual object. The second surface will treat a prime like a virtual object. A prime will be a virtual object for the image i. Yes or no? Are you all there with me? A prime is the virtual object for the image i. Right? Now, just like this, you know, we had this plane mirror and there was a beam that was attempting to converge at some A prime, but when it encountered the mirror, it got reflected and it converged to some point I. So then for the mirror, what's the object? A prime. And what kind of an object is it? Virtual object and I is the image. So same concept applied here. Do you realize this? A prime is the object for I and A prime is a virtual object because rays of light never could converge to point A prime. Right? So this was like a notional object for the image I. A prime was just a notional object for the image, final image I. That means the image that would have been formed by the first surface acts as a virtual object for the Second surface, the image that would have been formed by the first surface acts as a virtual image for the second surface. Virtual object for the second surface. Got me? Right, Vishal? Hmm? Now, say this was an intermediate image, which was an object for second refraction. Let's say the image distance that you distance that you associate with A prime is algebraic distance that you associate with respect to O is V prime. And with the final image, the final image distance, algebraic image distance that you associate is V. Right? Alright. Now, for refraction on the first surface. For refraction on the first surface, this is where the incident ray lies. This is where the refracted ray lies. So this should be treated as the Object space, this should be treated as the image space, right? So then I can apply image space refractive index by image distance, etc. So then apply that formula on the first surface, in which case V prime is the image distance and U is the object distance, yes or no, for refraction on first surface, right? So refraction on first surface. Image space refractive index mu by image distance V prime, right? Minus object space refractive index by object distance U is difference in the two refractive indices mu minus mu1 divided by the algebraic R1, divided by the algebraic R1. With R1, you would have to tag a sign. With R1, you would have to associate a sign depending on 
how this surface is oriented. For example, for the figure that I have drawn, the center of the surface would lie somewhere here. So, R1 for this would be negative in the same direction as the incident ray, negative. However, if this surface was like this, if this surface was like this, then the center of the surface would be lying here and then R1 for this surface would be positive because you would have to move opposite to the direction of the incident ray to locate the center of curvature of this spherical surface. Got me? Now, so V prime, V prime is the object for V. V prime is the object for V. Yes or no? So, for refraction on the second surface, for refraction on the second surface, V is the image distance and V prime is the object distance. Yes or no? Right? Now, that means we are talking of this refraction. For this refraction, this is the incident ray and this is the refracted ray. Mu then is the object space and mu 2 must be the image space. So, I can apply image space by image distance etc. So, then for refraction on second surface, image space refractive index by image distance that is the final image V minus object space is mu here right divided by the object distance V prime it's a, this in this case it's a virtual object right difference in the two refractive indices divided by the algebraic radius of curvature of the refracting surface got me hmm? I'm sorry uh, mu 2 by v prime mu 2 by v prime I'm sorry v v sorry mu by v prime I'm so sorry mu by v prime right now what are we actually interested in we are interested in to just two things the object and the final image this was only notional it was an intermediate image which never got formed right so v prime is of no interest to us it's only mathematical but then we can dispense away with that how if I add these two equations, then V prime goes into oblivion. Got me? So, we, we then connect UV and the geometry of the lens and the uh, refractive index of the surroundings and the material, right? V prime is not important to us. So, we don't need V prime. We might as well eliminate V prime by adding these two equations. So, then when we add these two equations, we get like a mu2 by V, mu2 by V minus mu1 by U. mu minus mu1 by r1 plus mu2 minus mu by r2. Yes or no? Mu2 by v minus mu1 by u is mu minus mu1 by r1 plus mu2 minus mu by r2. Does it make sense? Hmm? Now, In case the optical media on either side of the lens was the same, if we had mu1 equal to mu2, that means we had let us say the same medium on either side, the lens could have been immersed let us say in kerosene, right. So, then on either side you would have mu of kerosene, right. So, if as a special case, if mu1 equals mu2, if mu1 equals mu2, then in this equation plug in mu1 equals mu2 equals let us say mu prime equals mu prime, the refractive index of the surroundings, refractive index of the surroundings. Then you get like a mu prime into this equation, this equation turns out to be 1 by v minus 1 by u equals mu minus mu prime into 1 by r1 minus 1 by r2. That is what transpires. If I put mu1 equals mu2 equals mu prime, mu prime that of the surroundings, then this is what happens, right? Can I wipe this portion off? Just this portion, right? 
now when I divide by mu prime both sides, when I divide by mu prime both sides, then I get like a 1 by V minus 1 by U equals mu by mu prime minus 1 into 1 by R1 minus 1 by R2. 1 by R1 minus 1 by R2. Right? Where what's mu? Mu is the refractive index of the material of the lens. And mu prime is the refractive index of the surroundings. Right? That means this is the refractive index of the material of the lens with respect to the surroundings. Mu by mu prime. Refractive index of the material of the lens divided by refractive index of the surroundings will give me refractive index of the lens with respect to the surroundings. Right? So mu by mu prime is refractive index of lens material with respect to the surroundings with respect to the surroundings hmm? in case the surroundings is air then mu prime becomes 1 refractive index of air is 1 so this would then become mu minus 1 into 1 by r1 minus 1 by R2. This is the relationship between the object distance, image distance, and the geometry of the lens and the material of the lens, right? This relates to the object, the image, this is the geometry of the lens, and this is the material out of which the lens is made of with respect to the surroundings, right? So everything is assembled in one place here. Which refraction? But this is a straight line anyways. I am assuming rectilinear propagation of light. So this is a straight line. Where have I drawn a curve? Even if it's thin, there indeed is refraction. There still is deviation produced here. There is deviation produced here. Right? It's still a straight line. Shall I proceed then? Now, for a lens like we had for a mirror, this is the principal axis of the lens and if there are, if there are rays of light parallel to the principal axis incident on the lens, then subsequent to two refractions from the two surfaces from the lens, these rays of light converge to a certain point on the principal axis of the lens. Converge to a certain point on the principal axis of the lens. And that point is called the focus of the lens. That's called the focus of the lens. If rays of light parallel to the principal axis are incident upon the lens, then subsequent to refraction from the lens, right, they converge to a certain point on the principal axis of the lens and that point is referred to as the focus of the lens that point is referred to as the focus of the lens that means it corresponds to an image distance v when u is infinity when u is infinity it corresponds f corresponds to an image distance v when u is infinity right so when u is in this equation if you put u equal to infinity v becomes the focal length f if you put u equal to infinity, v becomes the focal length f of the lens, right? So, on plugging in u equal to infinity, v equal to f, we end up getting 1 by f because 1 by u is going to become 0. 1 by f, the focal length of the lens is like a mu by mu prime minus 1 into 1 by r1 minus 1 by r2. That's a property of the lens. So, this focal length is a property of the lens and it depends on two things. The geometry of the lens, the radii of the two bounding faces and the material of the lens with respect to the surrounding medium. With respect to the surrounding medium. Yes or no? Right? This is commonly referred to as the lens maker's formula. 
This is commonly referred to as the lens maker's formula. 1 by f is mu of the material of the lens divided by the material of the surroundings minus 1 into 1 by r1 minus 1 by r2. Correct? No. Dr. Sir. Now, if there is a lens such that rays of light after having got gotten refracted on the two surfaces actually converge to a certain point f, actually converge to a certain point f, then the lens is referred to as a converging lens. Then the lens is referred to as a converging lens. This is a converging lens where rays of light after having suffered refraction on the two surfaces, actually converge to a certain point, the lens is said to be a converging lens. Now, for a converging lens, in our scheme of things, in our sign convention, the focal length of such a lens is negative. The focal length of a converging lens in our sign convention is negative, right? Because to locate f, you have to move in the same direction as the incident ray. So, f is negative for a converging lens. Got me? Hmm? In contrast, you could have had a lens which could behave like this. After having suffered refraction on the two surfaces of the lens, it does not converge to a certain point, but it appears rays of light actually appear to diverge from a certain point. F. Rays of light actually appear to diverge from a certain point. Right? Rays of light after having gotten reflected on the two faces, they appear to diverge from a certain point, then that lens is called a diverging lens, it's called a diverging lens. And for a diverging lens, to locate f, you would have to move opposite to the direction of the incident ray and therefore f is going to be positive, positive, positive. For a diverging lens in our sign convention is positive focal length. Got me? Now, Look, there is nothing God sent about a lens being converging or diverging. The same lens. When I'm talking, when I'm talking of the same lens, I'm talking of the same refractive index of the lens mu, and we are talking of the same radii of curvature. So if you are not tinkering with that, you're talking of the same lens. All right. Now a certain lens. has focal length which depends on two things. The focal length of a lens depends on the material of the lens mu by mu prime minus 1 that is related to the material of the lens. This is material, this is the surrounding medium, right? Mu prime is the surrounding medium. And then there is a geometry factor associated with the length lens 1 by r1 minus 1 by r2. That is a geometry associated with the lens. Now, a certain lens, that means a certain mu, a certain R1 and a certain R2, right? When dipped, the sign of this you can't alter. You can't alter the sign of 1 by R1 minus 1 by R2. Until and unless you decide to pour acid on the lens and its surfaces deform and give you different values of the radii of the bounding faces, right? So, if you don't get cynical and harsh on the lens, that means you are not tinkering with the geometry of the lens. Right? So, this is the geometry factor of the lens with which you are not tinkering. However, and again, you are not, you, if there is a lens made of glass or crown glass, you know, you are not, you can't convert it into gold. Right? That is crown glass once and for all. Right? So, you can't change mu of the lens. Mu of the lens remains intact irrespective of the surroundings. Right? The geometry of the length, lens does not depend on the surroundings. However, what you have in your control is, well, today you might dip the lens in water. Tomorrow you may dip it in turpentine 
and then you may dip it in petrol and kerosene. You may dip it in milk. Whatever, right? So you can you can change the medium in which you are dipping the lens, right? And the sign of F, the sign of F will tell you whether the lens is converging or diverging. For our sign convention, when F turns out to be less than zero, it's a converging lens. F greater than zero, it's a diverging lens. But the same lens now, well, mu by mu prime could be greater than one, depending on whether mu prime is greater than mu or mu prime is less than mu. It could be greater than one or less than one, right? So you may dip it in a medium. You may dip it in a medium for which mu is greater than mu prime. This will become greater than one, greater than zero. Right? Positive. But you can again dip it in a medium in which mu prime is greater than mu. This will become less than 1. This will become negative. Right? So the sign of this can be positive or negative depending on the surrounding medium. And you have options of plunging the lens in a variety of media. Optical media. Right? So this could vary depending on mu prime so in a certain situation this is positive this is negative in some other situation this is negative and this remains negative right for example so then the sign of this expression can change depending on mu prime mu prime can change the sign of this entire thing that means mu prime can change the sign of f so, if a certain uh, certain lens behaves converging in a certain medium, it could behave diverging in some other media, right? So, the same lens could be converging or diverging depending on the medium in which it's dipped. Fair enough. Now, wipe this off. Wipe this off. Suppose we have a lens of this kind, which is commonly referred to as a convex lens or a biconvex lens. This kind of a lens is commonly referred to as a biconvex lens. This is the principal axis and the lens is normally made out of glass. You don't make it out of copper, right? Right. Uh, so let's say mu is the refractive index of the material of the lens. Normally, when it's made of glass, uh, mu is close to 1.5, 1.5. And when it's placed in air, when it's placed in air, the refract mu prime is one. Mu prime is one. R1 is the radius of this bounding face, and R2 is the radius of this bounding face. Algebraic radius. Hmm? The incident ray is like this. Say the incident ray is like this. The focal length of the lens, mu by mu prime, mu prime is one here, right? Mu prime is one. Refractive index of air, mu minus one into one by R1 minus one by R2. So when made of glass, mu is greater than one. When made of glass, mu is greater than 1. So, this becomes positive in air. In air, this becomes positive. Hmm? Now, R1. Is R1 positive or negative? Where does the center of this face lie? Imagine this to be part of a sphere like this. Somewhere here. So, R1 would be negative. R1 is negative. How about R2? Positive, see, it's like this. The center lies somewhere here. So, R2 is positive. So, then this is negative, 
This is positive, so this difference is negative. This is negative, right? So this whole thing is negative. And this is positive. So product is negative. So F turns out to be less than 0. So then what kind of a lens is this? Converging lens. So this kind of a lens when made of glass and placed in air, it's a converging lens. It's a converging lens. So this lens, the biconvex lens, when placed in air and made of a material whose refractive index is greater than that of air, that is greater than 1, it will behave like a converging lens. It will behave like a converging lens. However, the same lens when dipped in some other medium could also be a diverging lens, but in air, this is a converging lens when made of glass, for example. Okay. Similarly, A lens of this kind this is R1, this is R2. Hmm? This is the incident ray. And again, mu and surroundings are air. This lens is commonly referred to as a concave lens or a biconcave lens. This is a concave lens, for example. Hmm. Now, the focal length of this lens, mu minus 1 into 1 by r1 minus 1 by r2. Is r1 positive for this lens or negative? Positive, because look, this is like a sphere like this. The center lies here, you would have to traverse opposite to the direction of the incident ray. So, R1 is positive. The center of this lies where? Right here. So, R2 is negative. So, this difference is positive. This difference is positive. Whereas, mu minus 1 is positive. Mu minus 1 is positive. Right. So, the product is positive. So, f is greater than 0 and when f is greater than 0, the lens must be a diverging lens. That means, it is going to spread out a ray of light and it will seem like diverging from a certain point f. Seem like diverging from a certain point f on the principal axis. So, that is a diverging lens. So, when placed in air and made of a material optically denser than air, this behaves like a diverging lens. Okay. Now, for a regular converging lens, for a regular converging lens, suppose this is a converging lens. Okay, there is an object O. There is an object O. Let us say its image is formed at I. There is an object O and its image is formed at I. Real image. This is an object O and let us say there is a real image. Although it could also form a virtual image. But my next discussion is about a real image in a converging lens. The discussion is about a real image for a converging lens. Doesn't mean that a converging lens will always form a real image, it could form a virtual image as well. But we are right now talking of a real image in a converging lens, real image in a converging lens.
suppose x is the magnitude of the object distance x is a positive number x is the magnitude of the object distance and let's say y is the magnitude of the image distance y is the magnitude of the image distance and let's say f0 is the magnitude of the focal length just the magnitude so these are all positive numbers right magnitude of the focal length hmm. so then the lens makers formula the algebraic focal length f the algebraic focal length f is like mu my in uh, we don't need this we have arrived at the result we have arrived at the result 1 by v minus 1 by u equals mu by mu prime so surroundings is 1 minus 1 into 1 by r1 minus 1 by r2 and like i told you like i told you when u is infinity that means a parallel beam incident on the lens v is the focal length of the lens v is the focal length of the lens this then turns out to be 1 by f this then turns out to be 1 by f right we just figure that out so 1 by v minus 1 by u is 1 by f is the regular lens equation lens equation regular lens equation now where u v and f are algebraic u v and f are algebraic 1 by v minus 1 by u is 1 by f where u v f are algebraic now if x is the magnitude of the object distance, what is u? What is u in this case? x. u is x, right? y is the magnitude of the image distance. What's v? Minus y. v must be minus y. y is a positive number, but v is negative because to look at i, I am moving in the same direction as the incident ray for a real image. For a real image, I would have to travel like this. So, V is minus A, minus Y, sorry, V is minus A. It's a converging lens, so it's algebraic focal length F must be negative, negative, F must be negative. So, if F naught is the magnitude of the focal length, if F naught is the magnitude of the focal length, what must be F? Minus F naught, minus F naught, right? F must be minus F naught. Where x, y, and f naught are magnitudes of object distance, image distance, and focal length of the lens, right? These are magnitudes. So then, this was algebraic. This was algebraic. U, V, F were all algebraic. Plugging in u equal to x, v equal to minus y, and f equal to minus f naught, we get minus 1 by y, minus 1 by x is minus 1 by f naught minus 1 by x no, f naught right where x y and f naught are not algebraic they are magnitudes of object distance image distance and focal length of the lens got me hmm? so this gives me a 1 by x plus 1 by y is 1 by f naught that's the lens equation for a converging lens in a real image formation. For a converging lens, when the image formed is real, the relationship between magnitude of object distance, magnitude of image distance, and magnitude of focal length is this, is this. Right? Now, Important thing is, 
Look, 1 by x plus 1 by y is 1 by f0. Hmm? Then this is the object distance, magnitude of object distance. This becomes magnitude of image distance, right? Huh? Swap the rows. If this becomes the object distance, then this should become the image distance, right? So there is a lens. If there is a lens, converging lens that's forming a real image. If there is a converging lens that's forming a real image, and if the object distance is 3 centimeters and image distance is 7 centimeters for a real image, then we can also say that when the object distance is 7 centimeters, the image distance will become 3 centimeters. They are interchangeable. X and Y are interchangeable here, right? If X becomes Y, then Y should become X so that the reciprocals add up to a constant 1 by F0. Yes or no? Right. No. X and Y are swappable, are swappable. If X is the magnitude of the object distance and Y is the magnitude of the image distance for a real image in a converging lens, then we can conclude that if Y becomes the object distance, then X should become a, become the corresponding image distance for a given lens which is converging in a real image formation scenario, in a real image formation scenario. Got me? Which means now, look at some very simple things. In a converging lens, then, what's the distance between the object and its real image? x plus y. The distance between the object and its real image is x plus y. Got me? So, d, suppose, is the distance between the object and its real image. That must be equal to x plus y. x and y and f0 are all positive numbers. x, y and f0 are all positive numbers. So, if we have a certain set of numbers that are positive, can I say that the arithmetic mean of those numbers must be greater than or equal to the harmonic mean of those numbers? If I have a certain set of positive numbers, can I not say that the arithmetic mean must be greater than or equal to the harmonic mean? Right? So, x plus y by 2, the arithmetic mean of x and y, the arithmetic mean of x and y must be greater than or equal to the harmonic mean, which is 2 by 1 by x plus 1 by y, am greater than or equal to hm, am greater than or equal to hm, yes, right? Hey. 1 by x plus 1 by y is 1 by f0 is 1 by f0. So, this 1 by f0 appears in the numerator as 2 f0, as 2 f0, right? So, that leads to x plus y greater than or equal to 4 times f0. But x plus y is capital D, capital D, right? So, capital D greater than or equal to 4 f0? x plus y is the distance between the object and its real image, right? So, the minimum distance between an object and its real image in a converging lens must be 4 times the focal length of the lens. That's a very important result. This d greater than or equal to 4 f0 is the minimum distance between an object and its real image, an object and its real image for a converging lens must be four times the focal length of the lens, must be four times the focal length of the lens. And when would d become equal to 4 f0? When arithmetic mean becomes equal to the Harmonic mean. D would become equal to 4 F0 when the arithmetic mean becomes equal to the harmonic mean. And when would the arithmetic mean be equal to the harmonic mean? When x equals y. When x equals y, capital D will be equal to 4 F0. When x equals y, capital D will be equal to 4 F0. Hmm? 
sorry no then x will be equal to y equal to 2 f naught why focus 2 f naught see when d becomes 4 f naught x will be equal to y and each will be equal to 2 f naught because their sum is 4 f naught and they are equal right so this is important the minimum distance between an object and its real image for a converging lens is four times the focal length of the lens it can be greater than the focal length but can't be smaller than the focal length for a real image for a real image in a converging lens scenario now Suppose there is a converging lens. I mean, since the lens is very thin, let me designate the lens by a thin line. It's easier to draw, right? This is a converging lens, say. Okay. And it's placed on a bench and can slide on the bench. It's placed on a bench and can slide on the bench. This bench is commonly referred to as an optical bench. This is commonly referred to as an optical bench. Hmm? This is a lens whose magnitude of focal length is f0. Magnitude of focal length is f0. Suppose the object is at O initially at a distance x from the lens, at a distance x from the lens, hmm? and the image is formed at i. Image is formed at i at a distance y from the lens. At a distance, real image means it has to be formed on this side of the lens, right? Rays of light after refraction must converge. Okay. Now I place a screen where the image is. This is a screen where the image is. Screen. Hmm. What's the relationship between x and y? 1 by x plus 1 by y is 1 by f0, where x and y are positive numbers, f0 is the magnitude of the focal length, right? So, what we are doing is, when an object is at O, the screen is placed such that the image is formed on the screen. We then say in common parlance that the, uh, the object is focused on the screen. The object is focused on the screen. That means its image is formed on the screen, loosely speaking. Now, the lens is movable, let's say. The object is fixed and the screen is fixed and let's say the lens can slide along the optical bench. A mechanical mechanism is going to enable sliding of the lens on the bench. Hmm. I move the lens. This maintaining the object, I move the lens. I shift the lens. Let's say to a new position, I shift the lens to a new position, new position, same lens, I shift to a new position and when I am shifting at a certain distance from the original position, let's say at a distance small d from the original position, I again find that the image is formed at i itself, same position. Can, could this have happened? For the same object, a new position of the lens and yet the image is formed for the object O, oh, the image is still formed at i. Is that possible? Yes, because when the object distance is x, image distance is y. However, when the object distance becomes y, 
then the image distance becomes x. The image distance becomes x. So it's possible, right? For an object distance x, the image distance is y. But for an object distance y, the image distance would become x. So there are distinct two distinct positions of the lens for which the image is formed on the screen once again. Image is formed on the screen once again. Are you all there with me on this? Jai. Yeah, I said, see, we had this. When the object distance is x, the image distance is y. However, when the object distance becomes y, the image distance becomes x. So, by shifting the lens, I am altering the object distance. So, even though when the object distance was x, the image is formed at a distance y. However, when I, if I can make the object distance y, the image will be formed at a distance x. That means at the same position from this, right? Which means, by what amount has the, has the lens shifted? The lens has shifted by an amount magnitude of x minus y. I mean, it could have been on either direction. So, I am not committing to whether it is y minus x or x minus y. In general, magnitude of x minus y is the shift in the lens so that the object is again focused on the screen. So, that the object is once again focused on the screen for two positions of the lens. I will have the same position of the image for a given object, right? Can I say then that mod x minus y whole squared is like of x plus y whole squared minus 4xy? Hey, but x plus y is fixed, the distance between the object and its real image. I've already fixed that because I'm not changing O, I am not changing the position of the screen. So then, this becomes capital D, the distance between the object and the screen, which I am maintaining, which I am maintaining for this situation, D squared. And what is xy? See, from this equation, xy turns out to be equal to f0 into x plus y. f0 into x plus y is xy. But x plus y is D, capital D, distance between the object and the screen. So, df0, hmm. so this becomes minus 4d f0, minus 4d f0. So, then d, small d mod of x minus, minus y is root d squared minus 4df root d squared minus 4df would be mod of x minus y. And this also tells us that d has to be greater than or equal to 4f0 for this to be root of this to be real, right? Because capital D is real, d minus 4f0 has to be greater than or equal to 0, which we derived earlier as well from the AMHM inequality, right? d greater than or equal to 4 times the focal length of the lens. That's the shift root d squared minus 4d f0, all right? This is a very useful uh, thing, you know, especially for uh, problem solving exams, tests, etc. You know, these problems set on optical bench are very popular. So, easy to understand but and, and easy to score once you understand this. Okay. Can I wrap this off? Have fun, but stay out of trouble. Yeah. Now, look at a plane refracting surface. Plane refracting surface.
separating pair of optical media mu1 and mu2 separating a pair of optical media of refractive index mu1 and mu2 say there is an object o and it's being viewed normally by an eye here it's being viewed normally by an eye there that means you know this eye will witness rays that are very that are very close to the normal ray that are very close to the normal ray so then one ray is, one ray of light will go this way angle of incidence zero angle of refraction is zero it will go undeviated it will go undeviated one refracted ray the other refracted ray again very close to this so that the paraxial ray treatment can be applied right for the paraxial ray treatment we have the other ray again very close to the normal ray very close to the normal ray in the earlier case the normal ray in a mirror was the principal axis right principal axis so all other rays were very close to the principal axis really that was the assumption in the paraxial rays for this to be a paraxial ray traversal the other ray again i'll draw uh, only for the heck of um, clarity i'll draw it spread apart but then this ray is again very almost parallel to this ray almost parallel to this ray gets refracted here gets refracted here so this is one refracted ray this is another refracted ray got me and then the two rays the two refracted rays appear to come from a point i appear to come from a point i i then is said to be the image of o i then is said to be the image of o so if there is an eye viewing here he will not find o where it is in certain situations it will appear raised in certain situations it will appear dipped compared to o in this case for example you know it's gone on to a rarer medium and the object appears raised right in contrast you know it could have traveled into a denser medium and in its traversal into a denser medium then the two rays would seem like coming from i and the object would appear deeper than it actually is the object for an eye viewing here would appear at i because these rays of light seem to be coming from i for an observer here normal view paraxial ray normal viewing all right so it might appear raised or it might appear lowered depending on whether it's traveling from denser to rarer medium or rarer to denser medium right now in this case this is said to be the real depth hr this is said to be the real depth hr right this is the real depth of the object whereas this i would not suggest hr right would think that the object is located at i and this would be referred to as the apparent depth ha would be referred to as the apparent depth ha hmm? can i apply the following fraction the formula for refraction on curved surfaces image space this is mu1 this is where the incident ray lies this is where the refracted ray lies can i treat this as as the object space and this as the image space so image space refractive index by image distance image distance is ha plus ha why because measured opposite to the direction of the incident ray by ha minus object space image space refractive index object space refractive index in mu a mu1 divided by object distance object distance is hr object distance is hr is difference in the two refractive indices mu2 minus mu1 divided by the radius of curvature of the surface which is how much infinity a plane surface is a curved surface with radius of curvature infinity so this by r where r tends to infinity where r tends to infinity 
For a plane surface, it's a curved surface with infinite radius of curvature. So this will become zero. This will become zero. Right? So if this becomes zero, I get like a apparent depth H A as real depth H R divided by mu1 by mu2 mu1 by mu2 apparent depth is real depth divided by mu1 by mu2 which is hr divided by mu of 1 with respect to 2 that's hr divided by mu of 1 with respect to 2 how about it mu of 1 with respect to 2 means refractive index of the incident medium with respect to the surrounding medium or the refracting medium. Refractive index of the incident medium with respect to the surrounding medium or the emergent medium. This is the emergent medium. Mu of 1 with respect to 2. So, if this is air, mu 2 is going to be 1. If this is air, mu 2 is going to be 1. It's going to be hr by mu 1. Rather. So, real depth by apparent depth now. What's the shift produced? What's the shift produced? The shift produced is HR minus HA. The shift produced is HR minus HA. So, vertical shift is HR minus HA. Where H A could be written as H R by mu of 1 with respect to 2. That's the vertical shift. If this shift is upwards, this will be a positive number. If this shift is downwards, it's going to be a negative number. So, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. HR minus H. This is H. R. I'm sorry. HR. Right. HR into the real depth into 1 minus 1 by mu of 1 with respect to 2. That's a vertical shift. Right. So, the shift when it's upwards, when it's upwards, this is going to be positive. That will depend on the mu of 1 with respect to 2, which could be greater than 1 or less than 1. Accordingly, this could be a positive number as well as a negative number, right? Now, a generalized result for this. Is like when you have several layers of immiscible media, several layers of immiscible media topped over each other, stacked on each other. Let's say this is mu one mu2, mu3, going this way, up to mu n, mu n, and the final medium is mu m. This is the emergent medium. This is the emergent medium. And several layers of Optical media, thickness H1, thickness H2, H3, going this way, thickness Hn. And if there is an object O here, there is an object O here and is being viewed normally by an eye there.
then each of these layers would cause a vertical shift it could be positive as well as negative the total vertical shift produced by these n layers of optical media would be the algebraic shifts produced by each one of them so in this case shift produced by this would be h1 into 1 minus again i'm not deriving this result for you just take it lying low 1 minus 1 by mu of 1 with respect to the medium that's viewing it that is mu of 1 with respect to m that would be mu 1 by mu m plus shift produced by the second layer is h2 into 1 minus 1 by mu of 2 with respect to m plus h3 into 1 minus 1 by mu of 3 with respect to m going this way hn into 1 minus 1 by mu of n with respect to m that's a useful result that's a vert total vertical shift four total vertical shift of o nay again it won't be mu of 2 it's with respect to the i uh, I can derive this for you explicitly. What really happens is, it's not going to be with, with respect to this. It's like, we would assume that this will go the way we handle this is that the image for first refraction becomes the object for second refraction and so on and so forth. I can, I have not derived this. If I continue doing that way, it will turn out to be this result only. Let me, must remember this result, very useful result. See, the real depth and apparent depth, real depth and apparent depth, these two numbers are separated by a factor mu1 by mu2. And let me tell you, and whenever I have to apply this, now I don't think of this formula. The way I look at it is, suppose this is a boundary separating two media. This is mu1, this is mu2. And say I know that this is denser than this or this is denser than this. I would know from the values of mu1 and mu2 given to me. And this is an object. All that I do is I draw a ray diagram. And if I know that it's traveling from a denser to a rarer medium, it's going to bend away from the normal. Right? And then I know that the image is this. This, is, this corresponds to the apparent depth. So then this number x and this number y, I know from the figure, for this figure, for example, I know that y is less than x. So given x, if I have to get y, then I will divide x by a number greater than 1. I will divide x by a number greater than 1 so that y is less than x, so that y is less than x. Now, all that I need to figure out is whether it's going to be mu1 by mu2 greater than 1 or mu2 by mu1 greater than 1. So that y becomes less than x. I don't think of mu1 by mu2, mu2 by mu1, etc. I just, from the, from the diagram, for this diagram, I know that y is less than x. And y and x are separated by a factor which is mu1 by mu2. So y is x divided by a number greater than 1 so that y becomes less than x. Right? And this number 
I figure out which of the two, whether mu1 by mu2 is greater than 1 or mu2 by mu1 is greater than 1. I divide by that number. I divide by that number. Right. And if I had, let's say, something like this from the ray diagram, if I find that, well, it's bending towards the normal because it's moving into an optically denser medium, then this becomes the image, this becomes y, this becomes x, and now I know that y is greater than x. So, y must be x by a number less than 1, by a number less than 1, which could be mu1 by mu2 or mu2 by mu1, and I divide by a number less than 1. So, we just do it with this sense, you know, real depth, apparent depth. We do it with this sense from the ray diagram. Don't, don't think of the formula. Just think of the ray diagram and you know which is greater, y or x. And connecting it with the same, you either divide by a number greater than 1 or number less than 1 as the case is. That's, that's how you handle that. Huh? Now, Suppose I have a glass slab placed in air. So, glass slab is made of mu which is greater than mu of air that is greater than 1, right? Say a glass slab. Huh? of a certain thickness T for example of a certain thickness T and placed in air let's say there is an object O Placed in air. Incident ray. It goes from optically rarer to optically denser medium. So, it is going to bend towards the normal. And now, from an optically denser to an optically rarer medium, it is going to bend away from the normal. So then for an eye which is placed in air, for an eye which is placed in air, the object does not appear at O, but this is where this ray seems to be coming from. For the eye placed in air, the object appears at I, which is the final image after two refractions, which is the final image after two refractions. Hmm? So, after two refractions, this is the horizontal shift, this is the shift produced, this is the shift produced, this is the shift produced, yes or no? Hmm? Oi is the shift produced in the direction of traversal of the ray. Suppose I locate O by a number x here, this is x. Now, you, can you conceive the following? Two layers of optical media. One is air, the other one is glass, and the emergent is air. Can you imagine this? One is air, glass, and emergent is air. The shift produced, OI, is the shift produced by the layer of air, which is x, the real depth, into 1 minus 1 by mu of air with respect to the emergent medium. Mu of this layer with respect to this is 1. 1 minus 1 by 1. Right? No? Plus, that formula which I wrote a little while ago, plus, shift produced by this t, this is t into 1 minus 1 by 
mu of this with respect to air is mu. This is zero. This is zero. That means this becomes independent. The shift here for the glass slab becomes independent of x. So even if you had placed the object here, the shift will still be this because this is zero. Because this is zero. The shift produced is like t into one minus one by mu. That's such a very very important result. Shift produced by a glass slab is thickness of the glass slab into one minus one by mu of the glass slab. One minus one by mu of the glass slab. A glass slab placed in air would cause an object after two refractions to get shifted by an amount t into one minus one by. Right? Is that okay? Okay. So this bunch of results, and I'm not really feeling very well. I'll have to let myself go and let you go too. But now the important thing is, I've been urging you to watch rotational mechanics one and two quite some time. And also waves. A uh, large numbers of you may have ignored this prospect of reading and viewing these stuff. So, to ensure that you do this, and this time it's, I'm not playing foul. It's not like I'm kidding about this. Last two occasions I've said there is a test and there was no test, right? So this time it's not the Jekyll's call. It's a real one. On Sunday, when you show up at nine, it will start with a test on rotational mechanics based on the two sets of DVDs. Day one, day two on rotational mechanics. I urge you to solve some simple problems, maybe from a Sengage, Sengage kind of a stuff. Okay, it'll be a simple test, but it'll be based on the two days of classes on rotational mechanics and wave mechanics. I am not including integration right now. That's the consolation. But Sunday, 9 o'clock, it will start with a test, a combo test on wave mechanics and rotational mechanics that you have seen over the two days. Those of you who want to see it again, Coordinate with Ritesh sir. Those of you who have not seen it, must see it. Huh? Both classes. Both classes. Alright. So, Sunday 9 o'clock. Come prepared. Come prepared.